do another one. So, oops, okay. So for, for this, um, yeah, so this pretty much just wraps, uh, wrap up our um, first chapter on Bayesian inference for a mean, uh, for a proportion. And I already posted the inference for a mean slides on Moodle. So hopefully you got the chance to uh, take a look. And again, once we are working on uh, in breakout rooms, you probably need to have access to this when we are doing those discussions. So this is on Moodle, you should be able to uh, download. So let's just um, get started on this. Let's see how much uh, progress we can make uh, today. And then we're going to continue on this um, chapter uh, next week as well. Uh, so as usual, I will try to uh, bring a motivating example. And um, here we're going to start to work with the continuous data um, um, for whenever we're trying to um, make inference about the average value of something, most likely we're dealing with continuous data. So I'm going to uh, give an example from a uh, survey. Um, that I've been working on uh, pretty extensively for the last few years. So we're going to focus on one particular variable is the expenditure, uh, which is a continuous variable. Uh, so I'm going to show that. And then, um, well, after that, you will see that we'll have some prior and posterior distributions for uh, the mean and standard deviation. And I'll have a chunk on um, several highlight summary of how to do Bayesian inference. And then most of the work will be done through lab two for you to practice the different ways of doing inference, just like the exact solution versus the similar solution. We're going to do a lot of more practice in the uh, mean case over here. All right, so to just get started, um, some of you know about this data set, I think, uh, because last semester uh, in my intensive, we used, um, well, not the same sample, but used the general data set itself. Uh, it's called the Consumer Expenditure Survey data. And it's a survey uh, conducted by the US Census Bureau for the Bureau of Labor Statistics. That's what uh, BLS stands for. Uh, usually, uh, it's actually a huge uh, survey, it contains a lot of um, information, uh, but mostly contains data on like family income, uh, family income expenditures, and their text, stati text statistics. And uh, you can think about consumer units as families, um, but I think it's defined slightly different. But for us, it's, in, it's enough to think about like a household uh, as a uh, particular observation itself. And overall, it will provide uh, information on the purchasing habits of US consumers. And I think um, the CPI index is actually um, updated and derived from some of the survey results um, from this survey as well. So it's a widely used survey, I should say, and a huge survey being done um, every quarter, actually, uh, for part of it. Um, so the data, or I should say the CE data uh, that, that is public available out there, uh, they have two different formats. Uh, they give you some tabular or aggregated, for example, like the number of uh, the total number of um, uh, certain types of consumer units and blah, blah, blah. So it's not the record level data, but like some kind of summary as tables. Uh, but they also have micro level data, meaning that uh, we can have record level uh, data. They call it public use micro data pump. Um, so it's at the level of the observation and we are working with uh, this micro data. And uh, most of the time people work with, well, in most statistics courses, I should say, people work with uh, micro level data. Uh, because, for example, if you're trying to do any kind of regression, you actually really need record level uh, observations to do any kind of thing like that. Um, so ideally, um, agencies will be able to re re release this kind of micro level data. And this is uh, the one that we work with, which I also posted on Moodle, um, is a sample um, that is public available that I downloaded from, from their website. So uh, we're going to work uh, with focus on the continuous variable is called TOT EXPQ, uh, EXPPQ. Don't worry too much about how they and like the codes and the name coding and everything, uh, but it refers to uh, the consumer units total expenditures from last quarter. So like I said, um, the data or the survey is conducted every quarter. Um, so every quarter they get this um, information. And we're going to work with a sample from the first quarter from 2017. And the sample size is a little bit more than 6,000 observations. And if you download that CSV file um, from, from Moodle, that will be uh, the sample you will see that we're working with. Okay. Um, so like I said, you can download the data and then you can read it. Uh, we're using overall tidyverse syntax. So we're using the read underscore CSV uh, function. And um, so I'm showing you mostly, um, you know, some summary statistics about that uh, particular expenditure variable. So you can see the minimum, the maximum, uh, most importantly, I guess the median and the mean, and also the standard deviation um, of that variable, at least in the particular sample that we work with. Okay, so it has a wide range. Okay, the minimum is 30, so I think that's dollars. The maximum is uh, quite large um, 
over there. And then the standard deviation, as we know, is a typical measure of variability, right? So it is also pretty high um, in a sense that you can see that there is a huge variability uh, in this variable, meaning that um, the values could change, could range um, a lot, as we can see from the minimum to the maximum as well. And we can also do um, plotting, which um, I would say this plot probably doesn't look as useful. You can see that this is super right skew distribution. Um, because, well, even from before, we know that the maximum is huge and then it's right skewed, very much right skewed, uh, meaning that we have some records with super large total expenditure, um, but most of the other ones, as we can see from the summary statistics, the median is about 6,000-ish uh, and um, mean is about 9,000-ish. So overall, um, as you can see, the graph shows it's going to be super right skewed and then um, which um, hopefully you know that when we are working with a continuous variable, if it's like this, we probably want to do some kind of transformation to make it a little bit easier to work with. And the most, I guess, uh, the easiest one or the most commonly used one is what we call the log transformation. Okay, so let's try to do a log transformation of this and um, try to see how that, how that looks. Okay? So when I do log, everything starts to at least look nicer. It's definitely something more symmetric and all that and easier to work with. Um, so this, I'm sure in your previous classes, when you're trying to work with numerical, uh, say if you're trying to work with um, linear regression, for example, uh, whether your predictor variables or the outcome variables, if they're like too skewed, you probably want to do some kind of transformation and log transformation is a very popular and uh, commonly used one. So for us, um, as you will see later, that in Bayesian inference, we actually also have to assume a data model for this variable. Okay, we're actually going to go with the normal data. And because of that, I guess that's another justification that if we work with the original scale, this is too skewed, nothing looks like a normal at all. Um, so we're going to violate that assumption when we're doing this kind of modeling technique. Um, so transformation is definitely very important uh, early on when you do that. So again, we do the log transformation. The code is um, shown at the top and all of the code, again, is in the markdown file that I posted. And uh, you can definitely um, play with it uh, later. Um, I would say using the log, I mean, overall seems fine and everything def definitely makes the interpretation a little bit harder. Like what is the log, uh, logged value of the expenditure. So everything will be slightly a little bit off. I think how, how intuitive it could be in our mind. Um, but for now, um, and I think in general, it's important to, to work with um, transformed data when you have really skewed um, numerical variables. So we're going to focus on the logged um, version of the total expenditure variable. Also, uh, a little review. Hopefully, normal seems very familiar to everyone. And we had an exercise, I think, from homework one, right, to try to work with normal density and all that. So this is, again, um, a very commonly used uh, data model. And for numerical data, in particular, uh, people use that a lot. So normal distribution is symmetric and bell-shaped. It has two parameters, mu and uh, sigma. Mu is the mean, and sigma is the standard deviation. And um, the probability density function, um, I won't repeat myself too much, but we have seen this, um, I guess, in the review lecture as well, when we're trying to uh, work with joint density, if you remember, okay? And then also the homework question, I think a couple of them also trying to uh, get some practice. I remember one of them is about the transformation, right? Data uh, variable transformation, how to find the PY uh, from PX, uh, FY from FX. Um, so this is, um, again, um, symmetric and bell-shaped. And then the only two uh, parameters are mu and sigma. And y is the outcome variable itself, and pi is a constant. So we have this general uh, PDF of normal over here. Um, also, I know some of you are trying to. So this is actually this graph is you uh, is generated using ggplot and specifically the stat function, uh, which well can be really useful if you want to overlay a few different um, you know density curves uh, one over the other. I know some of you for the homework question from homework one. I think the logistic distribution, the normal distribution, some of you are trying to use this, which is which is totally fine. And this is, if you check out the code, uh, you can see that I'm using that stat function uh, through ggplot and that I'm just doing four different normal um, distributions, okay? So takeaway message is the mean is where the density curve is centered. So if you look at um, the three, the cluster of the three over here, okay? So all of them are centered as zero, okay? So those are the last three over here. And then the standard deviation parameter changes the spread or controls the spread, 
of the distribution. So when we have the smallest spread or smallest standard deviation 0.5, uh, we'll see this is the, um, I guess the greenish, greenish curve over here. It has the highest peak, okay? And it has the smallest spread, okay? Compared to um, the last one, normal two, which is the uh, purple-ish curve, which is much shorter and then a much wider spread. Um, by the way, just like the beta density that I talked about last time, that um, area under the curve integrates to one, this is true for normal as well. Okay? That's why if you have a tall, like the greenish curve, uh, then it will naturally be a little bit um, narrower. And then if you have a short, like the purple-ish curve, then uh, it's gonna be wider because the area under the curve for each of them is gonna be um, one. And the last one over here is uh, the normal negative two and 0.5. So it's really trying to compare to this one. Uh, so both of them has the same standard deviation. So the general shape between these two are pretty much exactly the same, okay? But they're centered at different means. And, uh, and you can see that pretty much if you have the same standard deviation, but different means, the whole curve just shifted either to the left or to the right. So those are some general uh, properties of normal. And like I said, this is using ggplot of the step function. Um, this could be handy uh, when you're trying to, you know, compare different density functions on one graph. And just like what I said, the homework question of logistic and um, normal, I think, was an example that you can use the step function over here. All right, so now I'm bringing back um, to the independent um, observations that we reviewed early on, because you will see that a very big assumption that we're doing in this kind of models is saying that we, first of all, are gonna have a sequence of um, observations or responses, Y1 through Yn. And secondly, most often, um, we are gonna assume they are to be independently and identically distributed. So that's the IID concept. So mathematically, you can write any of the YI, uh, tilde means false, and IID on top of that, meaning that they're identical, uh, independently and identically distributed. And they're all following the same um, normal density. Um, so with that, uh, which I hope now uh, everybody is very familiar with this equation one, um, we are essentially because they're independent from each other and they all follow the same normal density curve. Um, so pretty much the joint PDF of all of the observations will just be a product of each of them. And the, each of them is actually uh, pretty straightforward because they have the same mu and same sigma. So the only uh, thing that you're working with is this yi, making sure that you have uh, the index i, don't forget, because uh, it's about each one over there. And, um, and then, yeah, you can do some simplification of this product because this is a constant raised to the power of n times, right? And then you can do something in the exponent as well, which is part of the exercise that we did. Um, but here, the main um, review and I guess uh, refresher over here is that uh, they're IID, okay? And we are working with the joint density if we know that all of them are from the same normal distribution. I will also add a quick um, comment over here. So we use capital Y or any kind of capital letter over here to represent um, the, what is it? The random variable, okay? And then we'll use little y um, or little x or whatever if it's the actual data. Okay, so that's why here, okay, we are having, uh, so of course, so I guess more formally, you can write this, sorry that I write Y in the same way, but I write the capital one a little bit larger and the smaller one a little bit smaller, but um, this will be a way to, to make it even more um, um, accurate or more formal. Uh, but here, it's not capital Y, okay, it's gonna be little Y because this is actually um, the density of the observed sequence. So just be a little bit careful because we, again, when I write it, they all look the same, but, but we do have, when I type it, of course, I try to differentiate the capital letter and the small letter. And for us, is capital ones are for uh, the random variables and the small ones or little ones, they are for the actual observed values. All right, so 